Susan, thank you for being there. Thank you for doing this. I'm really looking forward to talking to you, Andrew. Uh, let's start with the basics. Uh, what's the status of broadband in America today? Well, we've got a picture in America that's actually quite different from most of the other developed nations. Um, we've got for very high speeds and download speeds in America, cable monopolies, there are local monopolies in each region of the country, dominate that market. And so for 85% of Americans, their only choice where they live is going to be at their local cable monopolist. Um, we don't have any of the fastest 25 cities in the world when it comes to internet access in America. So we're not in the world's leaders, we're somewhere in the middle of the pack. We also internally have a very deep digital divide. So having an internet access at home is very tightly correlated to your socioeconomic status. So maybe about half of people um, with incomes between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a year have an internet connection at home. The number is even lower for people with incomes under thirty thousand dollars a year. Rich people tend to have internet access at home. And also nine percent of Americans can't buy internet access wherever they live because it's just not available, it hasn't been built out to their area. So that's the picture. How did we get here? I mean, it seems, again, the U.S. was the inventor of the Internet. The Internet started here. It still dominates companies like Google or, or, or Facebook or Apple still dominate the Internet globally. Uh, why? What's the divide? Why hasn't that led to people's homes? Well, there's quite a history here. So the great thing about the Internet is that you can reach anybody. That's the whole point. There's a universal addressability system. And uh, the whole idea was that the content provider, like a Google, um, would not be subject to the whims of the telecom provider. Mm -hmm. But we've got this huge split between the ideals of the openness of the Internet, which depend on openness and connectivity, and the just dirt and wires and money expense of building infrastructure in America. Mm -hmm. So we started off in America with the phone system that was the leader of the world, the envy of the world. And then uh, in about the 70s, I'm skipping some history here, um, the cable industry was launched in America. Now, cable initially was just for one-way entertainment. Well, I'll talk to you, I'll sell you programming. Um, but as telephone and cable started competing, particularly in the late 70s, cable had a tremendous advantage, which was uh, local exclusive franchises and then a law in 1984 that completely deregulated cable. So fast forward, since 1984 and now, cable, with its model of not being particularly open, mm -hmm. you know, not being uh, available for addressability everywhere, has taken the lead as a financial matter. It's much cheaper to upgrade a cable system than it is to dig up the phone wires and replace them with fiber. So we got to this place of local monopolies as a result of just policy vacuums in the United States. We got rid of a very long history of common carriage mm -hmm. under which the telephone operators had, had operated. They had to take everything, you know, make sure that it got to the place it wanted to go, and they weren't allowed to pick and choose among content. This was a trade-off for the enormous uh, expense that it took to build those telephone systems. So here's the deep problem. It's, this, these are infrastructure elements that are very expensive to build and operate on huge economies of scale. Mm -hmm. And cable has taken the lead, dominates the market, and the telephone companies are backing off. As a result of all this, we have no plan to upgrade to those very high speeds around the world that people are getting. And the cable operators have no particular obligation to serve all of America to close this internal digital divide. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got here. It's failures in policy, which I'd love to spell out in more detail, mm -hmm. plus just the frank economics of how expensive it is to build, it's very difficult to see any competitor to cable showing up right now. It seems as if there would, would have been a moment where the cable companies would have had to act like telecoms, where they would have sort of had to recognize the FCC or, or, or however it would have been, 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 been regulated, would have right. had to recognize that cable had to serve everybody, that there had to be the same sort of philosophy that had been applied to telecom uh, for 100 years. That is not the case, obviously. That's not the case, and it has been the case for 30 years. So starting in 1984, and we deregulated cable almost entirely, mm -hmm. we tried to claw back a little bit of that in 1992, uh, but there's nothing in the 96 Act that would make them act differently. So for the last 30 years, cable has been building under the assumption that they wouldn't be essentially regulated very much. That they're entertainment? I mean, was it as simple as that? Basically, they see themselves, it's deep in their DNA, 
they see themselves as just like any private store on the corner. No difference. They have never viewed themselves as a utility subject to these kinds of obligations to serve everybody, to serve them at a reasonable cost, mm -hmm. and to connect with other networks. None of that is part of their sort of ethos as an industry. That was part of the telephone industry, but they've lost this battle to serve Americans. They've mm -hmm. almost completely backed off, and they're, they've gone into their corner, which is wireless. Mm -hmm. So Verizon and AT&T are mostly wireless companies today, not providing wired infrastructure to Americans. So we've got high prices, huge digital divides internally, and the country as a whole is sagging in the national competition for connectivity. Let's go back in time a little bit and yeah. talk about common carriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, common carriage does seem to be a, a way of thinking about it that, that would, would begin to satisfy some of our needs for broadband. Mm -hmm. What are the origins of common carriage? How, did, how was that executed for by the telecom companies? Well, this is an ancient regime. This goes all the way back to people operating in the medieval era in, in Europe. The idea is when you hold yourself out to the public mm -hmm. in providing an essential transport or communications facility, you're subject to public obligations even though you're a private company. Mm -hmm. So the I, whole idea of common carriage, which actually came not only from inns, but then traveled through railroads and then reaches the telephone industry in 1910, is that uh, in exchange for essentially a private monopoly, you get to provide people with services, you take on public burdens to charge a reasonable rate, to serve everyone, and to not discriminate when it comes to content and uh, attachment. So yes, this regime, which still exists in law but has not been applied to the cable companies, would, if applied to our high-speed internet access picture in America, fix our problems. Okay. Now, what are the threats? I mean, the threats are, are yes, the digital divide. Yeah. I want to get to that. I want to focus more, to begin with, on the, 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 the notion of a free and open internet on the sort of the threats to democracy, not just of the divide, but of the, of, of the, uh, the possibilities that the ISPs or the telecoms are actually filtering or snooping or whatever the plans are. Is that, is that, is that, do you put that ahead of the divide or the digital divide is the... Is the, is the These the two things fit together. One is a symptom of the other. With no competition, essentially, for very high speed internet access in America, the provider has every incentive and no legal limitations to price discriminate, to make sure that it's reaching rich markets and charging them as much as they can possibly pay, mm -hmm. not serving the poor systematically, which helps the digital divide issues, and ensuring that um, they can provide specialized services, you know, their own video on demand, whatever it is, over their pipe, that they charge a lot for. Mm -hmm. So the risks really can't be overstated. You can think of the cable pipe as just one big flow of water and that pipe is controlled absolutely by the gatekeeper, the cable company. Just about four channels right now are applied to internet access of that giant pipe. Now they're moving to technology that would make the pipe essentially undifferentiated. It's all the same stuff, but the gatekeeper, the cable company, can pick and choose among communications, look at whatever it wants to, you know, send some communications to Topeka when you thought you were going to Chicago, all kinds of opportunities for twisting dials that would remove the threat to them of competition mm -hmm. from services that they would like to sell Americans. Mm -hmm. So think of anything, home security, video, whatever it is, cable guys can choose what will feel more uh, live to the consumer and can pick and choose among what goes online and just deliver that to households. So it's, it's like living in a gated community, taking the idea of the internet, which is all about not having to ask for permission and being able to reach anybody in the world, and sticking that on top of an infrastructure which is absolutely controlled by a set of maybe four or five gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. There is a deep conflict there, and the threats are very real. Now, is that, now you've, you've been restrained so far. Your, your book is very much about the story of Comcast and, and NBC Universal and that merger. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't, you've mentioned four or five cable companies, you haven't yes. mentioned Comcast specifically. Uh, is the, the threat you're talking about, is that, is that present or future? Is that, are there signs of that, of that sort of threat now or, or is it more sort of a, a, a concern for the future of this kind of monopoly power? They're careful to restrain themselves. So let me explain. The cable guys uh, fought each other for franchises in the 70s and 80s. We call those the franchise wars. 
Since then, there's been tremendous consolidation in this industry. So Comcast, by far the giant, they have 50 million American.